Thank you very much, uh, and, and uh, for this opportunity to speak to to your customers. Um, so yeah, we're we're this is a new deck for KP. We just put it together in the last few months, and and we're going to talk about about uh, some new products, and then also how do you get the most most bang out of your buck um, when when you're looking for an antenna. Um, so let's just oh goodness. There we go. Uh, so this is the agenda. We're going to quickly go over antenna specs because I always believe it's good to have a ba strong basis of what is an antenna. Uh, talk about the new KP products, um, some frequency planning, uh, which will be part of the ROI discussion, and then some of the best practices at the end where we talk about alignment, how do you align the dish, let's say, um, or sector, uh, and then the type of things like separation between them. So let's just jump into it. Uh, if you've seen my presentations before, you've seen this slide where, where there's a lot of different properties that define antenna, everything from electrical. We mostly think about frequency band and gain and, and beam width, but I mean, we, we have everything in here. Um, and I'm not gonna go over all of them. If you see something that's kind of new to you and you're a little bit confused on, uh, raise it up as a question later. Um, but but in any case, like I said, gain, gain is king. Uh, and but. Uh, how you measure gain is also important so, and how we define it. So gain is always, uh, it's an absolute measure of an antenna's uh, uh, ability to focus power and us to be able to receive that power. So it's always relative to isotropic. Isotropic means if you had a, a, a point charge, a point source, it radiates equally in all directions. Um, but that's it's that's not um, practical or feasible in any way. So every, every type of device that radiates has some type of... Um, directivity it directs it in one direction so directivity is kind of gain without loss um, and then once you start to factor in loss into the equation so here we have a, a, a let's say a horn that has 10 db of directivity um, the loss uh, and then it only let's say the, the horn has 50 percent efficiency that ends up dropping down the gain to 7 db uh, 50 percent 3 db so you end up having less gain than, than directivity. Gain is always less than directivity because it takes into account efficiency. Um, a lot of vendors will end up reporting the directivity, directivity or they'll call it directive gain to kind of work it around it, or they'll just say gain. Um, but but, but the, the, when you get out in the field, you'll see it's actually a few dB, maybe even more than that, uh, than, than what was on the data sheet and, and when you did your propagation studies. So you're kind of a little bit disappointed. And, and that and the reason is, is because the definition of gain on the data sheet is not really the standard definition. Um, and so gain always needs to be measured with a, a calibrated horn. Uh, so these are the type of questions you can ask a vendor if you, when you, you're asking about their data sheet is how did they define gain? How do they measure gain? Uh, and then there's a few ways to measure, um, to back the hand, calculate the gain just based off the size of an antenna. The bigger the antenna, the higher the gain, the higher the frequency for a fixed antenna of, of size, the higher the gain. Um, the narrower the beam width, the higher the gain. So it's just uh, kind of things you can think in the back of your mind when, when uh, you want to do comparisons between diff two different antennas, let's say of the same size or frequency. Um, and then that's the NIST calibrated horn there. Now. Another very important spec here is front to back. I'm going really quick through this because we have some cool stuff at the end. Uh, front to back is uh, the difference between power going forward versus power going backwards. You can define it right at 180 degrees. That's, I, I say, the cheap definition where um, you can see here if this pattern looks like it has a front to back of 40. But you actually care about using uh, these sectors, um, two of them back to back over a wide, wide range of angles. So here, the actual, uh, uh, BASTA uh, definitions, base, base station antenna standards, um, which is used by all the tier ones and tier twos, is to actually take an arc um, over 60 degrees total, so plus minus 30, around the backwards direction. And you take the maximum value of the pattern in that direction. And you can see here the front to back decrease from minus 40 to minus 33. But this is actually useful for you when you're doing your isolation and noise uh, calculations to figure out how much separation you need between two sector antennas. Uh, very similar to cross pull. Uh, so cross pull, it, it really, it's the difference between, um, or cross pull discrimination, difference between your, your pattern that you want, you know, your cold pull, let's say your age polarization, and then the pattern you don't want uh, to receive. So if, if this is H pull, then the red would be V pull. If this was plus 45, um, the red would be minus 45. I'm just going to see if I can 
just throw on my laser pointer right here. So this would be minus 45. So the difference, cross-pole discrimination, is the difference between the co-pole and the cross-pole. Now you can define it right at zero degrees. So here it says it's, you know, minus 32. Um, but really, we use a sector over its sector, whole sector. That's why it gets that name. So really, you care about the cross-pole over all the usable angles you're going to be using that at sector antenna. So here, we're defining it with respect to its 3 dB beam width. This is a 65-degree sector. Uh, and you can see the cross pull actually decreases to 18. This is still a pretty good cross pull. Um, I've seen it as low as down to five, and you're still able to get good uh, MIMO performance. So cross pull is needed for MIMO, um, M-I-M-O. Uh, 10, 10 is, is definitely acceptable, five is, is doable, but but any when you're getting below five, let's say three dB, that, then you're gonna have a little bit trouble dis distinguishing, at least the radio distinguishing between two separate pieces of uh, information. Now, polarization is another very important thing. So for years and years in, in our industry, we, we've been doing H and V polarization, um, but, but we're seeing a push to 45 slant with LTE um, especially. And, and the only difference between the two is if there's a 45 degree rotation of the electric field vector um, with respect to, to, the, um, to Earth, the, to your terrain. And, and, and what does that do? Well, it actually makes it a lot better on the radio because you have symmetric patterns for both plus 45 and minus 45. When you have H and V, um, you actually have different patterns, a little bit different, a little bit different beam widths, a little bit different front to back, um, and, and it makes the radio work a little bit harder to kind of lock onto each signal, because imagine you're receiving at two different signal strengths on each port. Um, so the radio's kind of, the, the receiver's got to lock on the highest signal strength or the lowest, and either one gets saturated or one is really low down, um, maybe close to the noise floor. So Another benefit here is, is not just the radio, but in, when you're propagating waves, plus minus 45 slant works much better when you're propagating over terrain. The, if, if uh, just due to the boundary conditions or, or, over when you're propagating over ground, the vertical polarization propagates a little bit differently than the horizontal. Um, and that can lead to different uh, received signal strengths on, on, the, uh, on the receive side. So, when you go to plus minus 45, everything gets equaled out and they both propagate exactly the same. They also have great, plus minus 45 has great uh, multipath propagation characteristics. Um, and, and, and that's kind of one of the reasons why we see plus minus 45 in, in all the cellular bands and, and the LTE bands, because that multipathing um, is very important at those frequencies. Now, if you have a difference between, uh, let's say your AP is transmitting H and V and your CP is receiving plus minus 45 slant, theoretically the max uh, uh, drop and gain you're going to see or link strength is going to be 3 dB. But typically you end up not seeing that just due to these multipathing and atmospheric effects where as it propagates uh, away from the antenna, the polarization is no longer pure H and V or 45 slant, somewhere in between. Uh, so what we've been seeing in the field, uh, and, and we have a, a number of different customers seeing this, is anywhere from a half a dB to one dB uh, drop in your gain when you when you have this polarization mismatch. Now, some receive, uh, some radios like the Mimosa uh, A5C, C5C, are able to actually deal with this uh, polarization mismatch and not um, actually see it uh, at the radio. So they have some back, some stuff going on in the back end, which kind of cancels out all the polarization mismatch. And then there's this paper here from Mimosa, which chats about it. Now, briefly, this is the last uh, repeat slide, or one of the last. Um, what is a sector? Well, a sector is just an antenna, maybe made out of patches, microstrip patches, all metal patches, which we stack it vertically in the up-down direction, you know, away from the ground. And what does that do is it takes the beam and it narrows it very, very finely. So when we, every time we double the number of elements, we end up increasing the gain by 3 dB and roughly halving the elevation beam width. Um, so most sectors around the um, around eight elements, uh, as you can see, the the beam width here for eight elements is around seven to eight degrees, and the gains, uh, at least for the 65 degrees, um, can be anywhere around 18. Um, you you can do higher, uh, and and we do that with our 90 degree sectors, um, and, and that ends up getting you a little bit higher gain, which is great uh, because that when you have a 90 degree sector, it ends up spreading it out more in the azimuth, so it's harder to get that gain. So we end up squeezing the elevation a little bit more. Now, I'm going to skip to this slide if it lets me. Now, we, we've seen the horns on the market for a very long time. 
um, but but and we see them being compared extensively against sectors and horns. Uh, and I'm not here to to uh, to uh, say one is worse than the other. I think each has their own application. But let's understand the differences between the two. Um, so so a sector antenna it's tall, um, long, rectangular. A horn circular. A sector has um, a, usually a wider azimuth beam width than the elevation beam width, so the elevation is narrow. Um, now a horn, typically a symmetric horn, has an equal azimuth and elevation beam width. What does that do? Is that uh, the gain is typically less for, the, for a horn than a sector because you're not squeezing that pattern in the elevation direction. Um, now one of the main differences when describing horns and sectors is the beam width definition of, of, the, of the beam width. So for a sector, we always reference the beam width with respect to 3 dB. So the beam rolls off 3 dB, um, and then and then we take take the the two angles where it hit, where it hits 3 dB, and we say that's the beam width. So this is a 45 degree sector, um, and then whatever 7 degree elevation. Now with a horn, it's you're actually looking at the 6 dB roll off. It's that's what it's defined on the data sheets. I, 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 and so when we do that, you can see that the um, the the horn rolls off the pattern up at 6 dB, and that's where we define the beam width. So this is a 45 degree horn, um, and then but it actually is defined as a 6 dB beam width. So if you're if you're using this and and trying to compare it against a sector, you you have to make sure that you have the same definition of beam width, because um, you can get in a little trouble where you're trying to replace sectors of equal at least on the data sheet equal beam widths on on the data sheet. But then you go in the field and you see that oh I'm actually seeing much significantly or significantly less field strength near the edges, um, which is this red region right here. And, and and just here's uh, some comparisons here of a sector versus horn. Um, and, and like I said before, you can't go and compare directly a 45 degree sector to a 40 degree horn because if we look here at the patterns, the red and the blue, the beam widths are totally different. And if I look here down here at the at the actual beam widths, the 3 dB beam widths between a 45 degree sector and a 40 degree horn, you can see it's it's you know vastly different. The 40 degree horn only has a 27 degree beam width. Uh, the true comparison, or the better comparison, is against a 60 degree horn because its 3 dB beam width is, is actually 41 degrees, where its 66 dB beam width is 61. Um, never, nevertheless, we could see if we compare the uh, the green and the red. So the red is the sector, the green is the horn, that the they have very similar patterns, and actually uh, the sector has end up having a little bit better patterns at large angles. Um, and now. Beyond just the side lobes, what what happens to the true gain? So this is a plot of the of the the, the patterns here, but it's not normalized to zero dB like it it is on the polar plot. On the linear plot, it's normalized to its max gain. So you can see here a sector has a significantly better gain over your coverage area. I mean, we're seeing uh, compared to the 60 degree horn, this is like a seven dB improvement, um, and then compared to the 40 degree horn, it's a four dB improvement. So yeah, definitely there there is a difference in the side lobe levels. You can see it right here. Um, but but if you if you care about getting really far out, then then you kind of will probably want to go with the sector antenna, uh, unless you're in some very hilly, very very kind of you know maybe a in shooting into a valley or something like that. Maybe a horn might do better. Uh, and and that's where you got to go look into RF propagation studies. Um, in order to find out what's the true antenna you want to use. So here, this is the ideal case for a sector, far, flat farmland, very little variation, maybe 50 feet, 100 feet variation. Uh, and we're looking between the you know 40 degree horn, 60, 60 degree horn, and, and a 45 degree sector, and you see it's going very far out. Um, so that's that's kind of the benefit of going, the higher gain of that sector. Now. The asymmetric horns, um, the gist of it is, is that an asymmetric horn just ends up being pretty much a sector antenna. Um, <clears throat> and this was supposed to be a 40, uh, sorry, 60 degree label here, but but you can see that the patterns are very, very similar. Um, the only difference is our sector actually has very nice patterns for, for the side lobes between 60 and 105 degrees, where the horn has higher side lobes. Um, and, and if you think about it, the asymmetric horn, it's, it's starting to approach a, a sector, except it's longer. <laughs> um, but its height is, is I, think, I, I don't know the exact height of this one, but, but it, it's, it's no longer that symmetric, nice circle shape. It's an elliptical shape. Um, so 
you, you end up just redesigning a, horn, a sector antenna, which we know works very well in the field. Um, and if you look at the total gain, the sector is still winning in gain because it has the smaller elevation beam width. Because uh, you would have to, to really elongate that horn a, a tremendous amount to get down to this elevation beam width. And, and the cost would just be way too much. So you see that there's still a 4 dB improvement in gain with, using the sector antenna. Uh, and I did the same study for 60 degree. But uh, we're just going to move on very rapidly here. And then this is just the, the field propagation study comparing a 90 degree asymmetric, a 60 degree asymmetric, and a KP 65 degree sector. And, and you can see we got out a, a, a fair bit farther, especially at large angles. Um, you can see that you're getting more, more signal strength at the larger angles. And, that, and that's primarily due to the different definition of beam widths. These are 6 dB roll offs, and this is 3 dB roll off, that beam width definition. Now we're going to talk about new products. So we're very excited to get these in, in stock. It's uh, cables with boots. So these are our LMR cables um, going end mail to end mail and then end mail to RPSMA. Um, and and, and we, we have different sizes. We have a two pack for the eight inch. These are, are the eight inch ones are, are good for, I'll show you pretty quick, a product we're really excited for. Um, and then for typical sectors, uh, for at least for KP sectors, you want to use anywhere from an 18 to a 24 inch. Some of our sectors with, that come with cases, um, or if you want to mount the radio really close to, to the sector, you can use a 12 inch uh, cable. Um, and then this one down here at the bottom, the 12 FX, this is for our, our uh, 11 gigahertz parabolic dish. Uh, so we do have the cables um, available with the boots for, for that uh, 11 gig dish for the uh, Ubiquiti 11 FX, which I'll discuss very shortly. Now, this is the product which I said that two pack is for with the cables with the boots, little short ones. This is a, a very cool product we partnered with Cambium on. It's a, it's an Omni antenna, it's, it's a short little one. Uh, it's got about 13 dBi gain, and, and, and you use this with the EPMP 3000, uh, and, and it's mu MIMO compatible, 4x4 mu MIMO compatible. So what does that mean is that you're going to be able to uh, use all the benefits of the EPMP 3000's access point hardware and software uh, to deliver the 4x4 mu MIMO performance, its scalability with the GPS synchronization, uh, and then of course uh, the three-year warranty with Cambium. Um, and you're able to get all those improvements in, in, in your throughput strength, uh, and, and it, it's it's uh, endorsed by Cambium. So, so this is something that they will be supporting with you in the field uh, if you buy this antenna and, and use it with their radio. Uh, it comes with the simplified mounting. So the, the radio actually mounts right down here. And then in this housing, uh, all the cables are hidden in here. So it provides a little bit of extra protection against birds um, and, and, and some, some light, light weather protection. Uh, at the same time, you go and use our cables with boots and it provides that extra layer of protection um, uh, on there. So we did some field testing back uh, late last year with a, with the client and, uh, and and we had some excellent results in the field. So this client, he, he's trying to service 18 homes or $5 million minimum dollar homes. So, uh, and then they got the Force 300 radios on there. And, and so these clients are very picky in form factor and, and making sure they can't really tell what the antenna is. So it's kind of funny, this guy, he's got an 11 gig dish right here. Um, mounted very close to the ground, and he had to do that because of, of the, the strict uh, architectural guidelines, which is very strange in this region. Um, but, but in any case, uh, he, he painted everything this, this camo color, uh, mounted our antenna, and he was very happy with it. So at, at evening and the, during prime time, uh, that's when he saw the, the best benefit, because everyone was trying to get on, and, and that's when Mu MIMO kicked in, and he was able to get an extra 30 to 50 megabits per second of additional bandwidth. Um, just by having Mu MIMO on this uh, Omni antenna. So this is a very lo low cost, uh, cost effective solution uh, for, for new areas um, or, or for small cell applications. And you don't need a big investment of four sectors, four radios. It's one, sec one Omni, one radio with multi-user MIMO. So one thing we kind of made a mistake on is, is the, we, we, we released two Omni. So one here is KP-5QS. OMNI-13. So this S is important. Um, that refers to this one. But we, at the same time, we released another Omni antenna, um, dash KP-5Q Omni-13. Uh, we're we're going to do a part number change to correct this. But in the meantime, this is our, our other Omni antenna. It's a four-port Omni. It, a little bit higher gain. 
uh, I, I shouldn't say higher gain, very similar gain, uh, but it's horizontal vertical polarization. And all we did here uh, is stack two of our five gig omnis vertically in, in the same same uh, rate home. Um, so, so this is kind of, you can kind of expect the same performance as, as our, our KP's normal five gig omnis or two by two, but you can use this with any radio. So this is uh, I, very clear and I should have put a slide. This is not multi-user MIMO compatible. Only the other one is the 5Q Somni-13. This is to use with any two radios, two ubiquity radios, two two by two camium radios, whatever you want to do. Um, and, and, and this will allow you to kind of put them on you have to put them on two different channels because if they're on the same channels, you're going to have isolation issues and cross-talking. Um, so two separate channels, two radios, um, or, or if you had one 4 by 4 radio that didn't need multi-user MIMO, you can do that too. And, and this is a great solution. It limits your tower footprint because now you only have to mount one Omni instead of two, uh, and, and you can still serve uh, you know, uh, three, uh, clients in 360 degrees of, uh, around the tower without having to put up two antennas. Here's a, our, our, we released these late last year, um, and we have stock of the uh, 11 FXs, but these are our new ProLine 11 gig parabolic antennas. Very, very high performance, very, very well-constructed antennas. Um, uh, very reminiscent of the radio waves design, if you're familiar with them, um, but, but these are now KP antennas. So we have two versions here. It's one for the 11 FX, and then one for the Mimosa uh, B11 Direct Connect. And, and and we have a lot of success with these. Oh, and a lot of people are loving them. Very fully assembled, um, out of the box. So the two foot and three foot fully assembled. Very little for installing. Uh, the 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 pole mounting kit is very robust. All the brackets are very robust. Uh, so we put this 155 mile per hour survival wind speed. I've personally seen uh, pictures of these surviving up to 175, 190 miles per hour. So this is just, you know, for liability sake, but I, they they perform really well in, in very very rough conditions. Um, fully powder coated. Uh, we use the trivalent chromium chromium on the brackets. Uh, so so for for rusting, you're going to see minimum rusting uh, on these antennas, and they're going to last for many many years. We have people um, pulling these dishes off, and like I said, they they were very based off the radio waves antennas, uh, pulling these off towers uh, after 15 years, and and they're they're perfect still. So well designed, very cost effective, and and and, and this allows you to put up you know 11 gig license link um, at, at, at very very rapidly. So we're very excited about these. Like I said, the 11 FXs uh, antennas, the two foot and three foot, are in stock today. The Mimosa B11s, they should be arriving soon. That that the virus kind of hit us a little bit, um, but but they should be in stock very soon. Now, in the theme of Proline, uh, the, we released these a few years ago. Uh, the Proline uh, five gigahertz KP dishes, the one foot and two foot, uh, awesome antennas, um, very great pattern spec, very stable gain across wide bandwidths, 4900 to 6400. Uh, perform really well in the field. We, we see people pulling, pulling. Uh, I, I'm just gonna say competitor A's antenna off the tower and putting ours up and they'll see a two to three dB improvement, even though they're the same antenna size. So this kind of goes hand in hand, what I said about gain and definitions. When we put a gain spec on the data sheet, that's measuring it the true way. And, and, we, and we give ourselves a little leeway. It actually can go up from this value. Um, and and so you can you you can be rest assured that that when you're doing your propagation studies, let's say in Link Planner, that if you put in 24 dBi, uh, you're going to be very close to that in the field, whatever receive strength you see from the your uh, propagation uh, Link Planner tool. So another very cool thing about these is the uh, the very low side lobes, which is great. And I'm going to show you what side lobes can do um, for you uh, shortly here. Now we have the N-type version. So two N-type connectors, and then we also have one for the Mimosa C5C. But I'm proud to announce that uh, just the last few, three, two or three weeks, we released the uh, uh, Quick Connect adapter for the Ubiquiti ISO station, 5AC Prism station, um, and then the ISO station M5. So this will fit all three of those type radios. Doesn't matter what region, U.S., rest of the world, and it's a very easy solution to get that radio onto the back of our KP dish. And why would you want to do that? Like I said, it's the improved gain. Doesn't matter what it says on the competitor spec sheet. I, I guarantee you the gain of, of this dish will be higher in the field. 
the, the side lobe specs is, is outstanding. So if you have some interference, your noise level is a little bit higher, you throw it on this dish, uh, you, you're going to see an improvement. Of course, it depends where the noise is coming from. If your noise is directly in your path, you might have a little bit of trouble. But um, th with this antenna, if that noise is at, 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 a, at a significant angle off the main beam, then, then you're going to see a very, very big improvement. Easy to install, no tools needed. So you climb that tower, you don't, don't even bring a wrench with you if, if the KP dish is up there already. Just snap this on. Another benefit is it allows you to adjust the polarization from H and V uh, to 45 slant. So just some product images here. I'm just going to skip that because, uh, whatever, stable performance. Yeah, great performance. We talked about this. Dual band omnis, very quickly, we, we have dual band omnis where similar to, to what I said with that five gig Omni. These are true Omnis, H and V polarization, but we, we end up putting two different Omnis in one radome. So two gig, three gig Omni. So this is four ports, two ports for each band, all in one housing. Allows you to reduce your tower footprint once again. And, and we do the same thing for two gig, two gig and five gig and three gig and five gig. Why do you want to do this? Is If you wanted to put two Omnis up next to each other, and I'm going to get this in our separation discussion, you got to space them apart a fair bit. Otherwise, you're going to start impacting the patterns in the Omni direction. So it, and this is just a, a, a very, very intuitive way to, to put up two different frequencies of, of an omnidirectional antenna. Another thing we're, we're working on getting into stock pretty soon here is, is our uh, vertical polarization omni. So these are single pull omnis. Uh, and, we're, and at this moment, we're supporting uh, 2 gig, 2.4, 5.8, uh, and 900 licensed and unlicensed. Now you may be wondering, why, why would I want to do this? This is more your, your utilities play, your very low low data rates play, where, where you're just trying to, to, to make sure you're able to, um, to, to, to pick up uh, to pick up a, a, a very low data rate signal very reliably. So these are, are, are um, very well constructed antennas um, and, and, and we expect to have these in soon. So, so if, if you uh, are interested in these for, for some very specific application, just reach out to, to, to Streakwave or, or, um, and, and, and we can start that discussion. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit out of uh, sync, I should move the slide, but this is the uh, our dual band Omnis uh, client testing. And the gist of it is they, they put our Omnis up and they saw pretty much the same performance as, as with our single band Omnis. The added benefit is it's just one Omni. So they're very, very cool. Uh, this is just getting into detail. I'm sure once this gets recorded and put on the web, then, then you can spend a little bit more time looking into this, but this is just a little bit more information uh, on how much improvement they saw, the increase in modulation rate, and so forth. Uh, our 900 megahertz Omni, this is the bazooka, the cannon, whatever you want to say. It's five inches across, um, about five feet tall, and, and it's a two-port Omni. And I got to update this. This actually supports 800 to 1,000 megahertz. Um, dual polarization, 45 slant, 10 dBi gain. Um, <clears throat> so we designed it for the PMP 450i, but, but you can use it with any dual pull 900 megahertz radio if you want. So it's got great azimuth pattern, so very little ripple. Um, and, it's, and it's awesome for, for just shooting through the trees. Um, uh, so typically, we, 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 you know, we, we tell clients, uh, so this is some of the field testing. With this type of Omni, you can get maybe up to five miles, but you know, three, three to four miles is your, is your sweet spot. Um, and it also depends you know, how much foliage you got in the area. So this is some testing we did in, in uh, rural uh, Ohio. Um, you know, mostly farmland, tree, tree lines, ravines, uh, and, and he was able to, you know, get a very nice performance out of this. He's using our, our 17 and 14 dBi Yagis on the client side. Um, so once again, I'll just, at your own leisure, when these gets on the internet, I'll let you peruse through that. But here's just a, a kind of a, a map of, of all the client signal strengths, and, and they were very happy, you know, they're uh, able to get good, good, good signal strength um, up to, here's the five mile mark here. Um, I think I think he would have reached out farther, but you would just add a, a lower signal strength too. But uh, in any case, is a very cost-effective solution to provide 900 megahertz support to to a broad range of clients. Um, dual pull 120 degree sector. I'm going to skip this. This is a great product we released last year. Um, very high gain, and then 120 degrees beam width. You can put one or two of them up, or three of them up. I, I think two is enough. Really, uh, it's very. This is a good cost-effective way. And what you end up doing is, if you have some clients here at 90 degrees, 
um, yeah, you're gonna, they're going to see less signal strength, but but uh, try to angle the sectors so that those clients are you're picking up the clients that are actually closer to the tower at those angles. Um, or if it's, that doesn't work for you, put three of the sectors up. TV white space released this last year, uh, so we have a dual pool sector and a single pool sector uh, with a built-in GPS antenna on there. Um, and, the, and then we worked with Redline to release these, but this will work with any any TV white space radio. So these are 12 dBi gains. Um, that they're a little bit smaller than some of the the bigger I've seen bigger ones before. But you know we wanted to provide a, a solution that's cost effective for shipping. This fits on a pallet, um, and, and also a little bit easier for you guys to get on the tower. And the wind loading isn't horrendous. Uh, so this has a direct mount option for the Redline RDL 3000. XP ellipse radio. Dual pull Yagi TV white space sector. Or, sorry, TV white space Yagi. Um, very cool. They're very similar to KP's 900 megahertz Yagi's. Uh, well constructed. And and one of the neat tricks is when you're installing this is you can adjust the polarization on the fly at at any angle you want to in order to maximize your your uh, your receive strength on both chains. So people go in the field to set it to 45 slant or HNV and then they'll fine tune it. To get the best received signal strength. Here's a flat panel. If the Yagi, you don't want the length, but you're okay with with width and height. This is the the flat panel has similar, little bit higher gain actually. Um, good good silo, but front to back performance, and it also has uh, mounting for for the uh, uh, RDL 3000 XB ellipse radio. So we did field testing with this and. Um, I'm just going to skip over this, but but it, it, the gist of it is that we very comparable to to the Redline panel, um, and then did a, a little bit better than than a smaller panel too, if a competitor's smaller panel. Um, Proline sector, so we have a small angle versions. We have two port and four port versions of the uh, two gig and three gig 33 degree sectors, um, and then we also have a a four port version of of a 45 degree sector. Very good front to back side low performance is is awesome. Um, here, here, here we gonna get into it and, and the type of frequency reuse scenarios you can get into using these sector antennas. So you can see here that that it, you have a little bit of side lobes here, but they're, they're very similar to a horn in terms of the azimuth pattern. Very similar, uh, so you can kind of expect that same type of noise level rejection uh, in the field. And, and what we ended up doing here on the next slide is I actually compared um, if we had a 45 degree horn antenna versus a 33 degree sector antenna. And, and, and here's an overlap of the patterns. You can see the sector does have a little bit higher side lobes. Uh, and then when we do the RF propagation map, um, you can see side lobes are a little bit there, but they don't reach in too far out. Uh, the horn, they're, they're not there. But you can see the coverage in the forward direction is very similar. It's very tight beam, a little bit wider on the sector because it has a slightly wider beam width. but um, in any case, it, it's almost like using a horn antenna. Of course, the, the, the size is a little bit different. The implementation on the tower is a little bit different. But on the field, people on the ground, this is very similar kind of performance. Um, this is our new line, our, our whole lineup of ProLine sector antennas. So we have everything from small angles, uh, 65 degrees, 90 degrees, two port, four ports, eight ports, dual band for two gig and three gig, three gig and five gig, uh, two gig and five gig. Um, and we just released this 2 gig, 5 gig, 8 port HV, uh, so HV polarization. Uh, we also have the slant version here too. Now, I wish I had a better slide to segue into this, but KP is going to be doing horn antennas. I said it. And, and and I'm really excited about this. We were, you know, we went back and forth on this for a long time, but we decided, you know, what we're doing it. This is, this is, I, I can see a compelling case. We did a lot of RF propagation studies to say why we want to do this. And and so here we are. Uh, we have the KP Proline horn antennas at five gig. They support all the way down from 48, 4900, so that's your public safety, and they pick up all the way to 6400. That's for your your rest of world international applications. So there's no horns right now. Um, I believe that do, does this whole range, at least with a very stable flat performance. So we, we're releasing a 30 degree horn. Remember that's 60 BB width, that definition. Uh, a 45 degree horn and a 60 degree horn. Uh, high gain, 
very you know industry leading gain in front to back performance we did comparisons against competitors and 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 we designed these so that we're beating them and what's that going to do it's going to give you a little bit better uh signal strength uh lower noise floor you're going to see in there so your center is going to go up um and so here we're, we're, these are the patterns and typical um you know uh frequency reuse scenarios here but I'm just gonna kind of go over this and, and talk about the ultra wideband performance, the electrical performance. So here's just a 3D map. You know, it's not as fancy as some of them. Um, sorry, and a, and didn't mean 3D map, but 3D patterns. Um, but you can see here that that in the backwards direction and, and here at low angles, the side lobes are very very low. Uh, this is plotted over 40 dB scale, and you can see there's nothing going backwards. Um, and then here down here, these three charts. This is your VSWR and then your port isolation. So some competitors don't even list port isolation, but you can see here that for KP, our port isolation is typically 30. Only at the high part of the band did we get up to 22, but 20 is more than enough. I've seen in some competitors' horns that the isolation is 20 across the whole band, and that's just due to the physical construction of the waveguide excitation um, and, and something they can't get around without changing it. So that's is uh, definitely a bonus for you. It, if, if your uh, MIMO performance really had stringent port isolation requirements. Now, the patterns are very consistent across the whole band. So here I'm, I actually plotted all the patterns from 4.9 to 6.4 gigahertz uh, on top of each other. So this, this is actually like 10 different plots all plotted on top of each other, and you can't even really see a difference between the two. And I go to the 60 degree, sorry. You know, we were going back and forth if we're going to do 60 and 90 or 45 and 60, but but this is supposed to be the 45 degree. I apologize for that. Um, so this is the 45 degree, very similar patterns, a little bit different here, but it's, you know, very tight side lobes down at the large angles. And then here's the 60 degree horn. Um, once again, apologize for the mislabeling, but uh, you can see here that the patterns are very similar across the whole band. So we're, we're you know, very stable performance, ultra wideband, and the electrical performance is just uh, uh, top notch. A uh, little bit different design as as some of the other antennas. Uh, very very similar technology, but but just the the optimization approach that we used was uh, different, which allows us to get uh, very nice performance. Uh, and you may be wondering, hey Justin, why are you showing me 3D renderings? Well, the prototypes we had, they weren't painted. We're getting those painted. We're gonna bring bring them to the show, uh, at Wisp America in Dallas, so you can come check it out, get your hands on them. But uh, mechanical design, very very awesome, as you know, KP. Um, we, we strive ourselves having a very robust design. So here you, you can see we have fine azimuth and elevation tilt markings, plus minus 25 on, on, on both of these brackets. Um, you're allowed to, to mount up to three and a half inch all the way down to uh, three quarter inch uh, on mounting. And, and, and depending on feedback, we might end up increasing this to four inches. But uh, this is kind of where we are right now. And uh, you can mount on both sides of the tower. So here I'm, I'm showing using the same bracket for mounting on both sides. You, you could use the different brackets and mount them on top of each other. But but I thought this is kind of cool looking. And, and this kind of allows you to do uh, four by four uh, if you had that type of uh, radio. Um, maybe not multi-user MIMO four by four, but uh, in any case, it would have four ports, this, this antenna. We have to do the testing for multi-user MIMO and get Cambium's blessing. Um, very lightweight, fully aluminum design, except of course the radome. Uh, the hard hardware is is not going to be stainless steel. We'll use galvanized steel um, in this case to avoid galling. And uh, oh, I think I have some videos here. Let's see here. There we go. Quick connect adapter. So very easy to use that quick connect adapter and change the polarization. I think I have one more video. Yeah, so it shows us how the polarization changes. So you can do 45 slant or H and V um, without any tools to, to make that change. So now that we're gonna have the horns, you could say KP can provide us a total tower deployment. So anywhere from backhaul, you know, use our two foot dish or one foot dish. Um, and then the horns for, 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 you know, close to the tower, let's say, or, or in a rural area, and then your sectors to get, get uh, really far out. Uh, so this is our, our dual band sector. Um, I think it's a two gig, five gig one. Um, oh, actually, I see here, I put three gig, five gig. But in any case, you put four of these around a tower, as many horns as you want, space them apart appropriately. Uh, we'll talk about spacing shortly. And, and you're golden with, with the fully KP solution here. Now, sector and omni deployment strategies 
Um, typically, what we see as, as people are starting out, um, they'll put up one one Omni antenna, and then and then they'll decide that they get a few more customers on there. They're they're reaching the you know they they're throttling themselves on the radio, so they go and put up two or three 120 degree sectors, and then then the next obvious jump is going to a 90 degree sector, and you put up four of them or three of them. But if when you go put up four of them, you you go you're deciding, hey, I want to start reusing frequencies. Some guys using mostly Uni one. I just want to stay at Uni three, 40 megahertz channel. So you reuse frequencies on uh, 90 degrees back to back, and that's how you do it. So this is called frequency reuse two. Um, and then let's say you have another site, and 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 uh, you you want to get even more customers on there. So you go up to a six sector scenario with using 65 degrees or 60 degrees, put six of them up, and they're they're sharing three three channels. Um, and, and then you can even go even more f further into it. You can go 45 degrees, eight of them. And and the ideal case is you're using two channels only, but but I think you'd have to probably go up to three channels here um, in, in some scenarios, especially if you can't space them apart too far. And then 33 degrees, you can get 10 on the tower, even more. Um, but we're gonna kind of talk about this in a real world, well, I, I would say almost real world application where you wanna upgrade your capacity. So let's say this is your region here. Here's, the, here's our, our, our spectrum of available channels um, of different channel widths for the Uni 1, the Uni 3 bands. So first you decide, hey, I'm going to put up four sectors. So you go put up four KP sectors, uh, let's say dual band 1, 3 gig, and 5 gig. So here I'm only plotting the 5 gig signal. But let's say you have 3 gig, you have some buy-sell equipment on the 3 gig, and a 5 gig, like you have some Cambium equipment or Ubiquity, whatever it is, Mimosa. Um, you put those up and, and they, these are doing great for you. But then you decide, hey, I want to actually try to see if I can compete um, and, and get, pick up some of these clients in, in town. Uh, but town's very densely populated and, and you're already using up all this spectrum right here. You see these sectors at 40 megahertz bandwidth. Um, oh, I don't have much time. So I got to run through this quick. But you said, okay, I'm going to put up a horn. So I'm going to go throw them in Uni 1 and 20 megahertz channel. So you go put up one horn. Then you go put up two horn, different channel. Uh, then you go put up three horns. So this is a, a 30 degree, the 30 degree, here's your 40 degree, uh, or actually that's probably a 60 degree. And then and then you put up a 40 degree. Now you can start reusing channels. So you're only using up this much channel space on in the Uni 1 and then using up all Uni 3. You actually have an extra channel here. Um, and, and then you decide, oh, I want to get pick up these guys and then these guys. And, and then you say, now I'm set. I got everyone. I mean, I'm using uh, all the spectrum nicely, but you're like, hey, I need a little bit more capacity. What can I what can I do here? Um, and so here here's all the all of them on top of each other. Well, you, now you increase your channel width. So those those um, horns instead of 20 megahertz channels, you go up to 40 megahertz channels. And now you're in Uni 2 though. Um, the downside of Uni 2 is you got a, a one quarter your power. So one of these horns will have to have a little bit less signal strength. You try to choose it so it's the one where where you're trying to pick up guys close to your tower. Um, or you just ignore the FCC regulations entirely, but I don't recommend that. Uh, and, and so this is that's kind of what you would have to do is reduce the power on one of these horns uh, in order to kind of get into Uni 2. But now you're at 40 megahertz channels on, on all of them. Now, if you're greedy, you can actually go to 80 megahertz channels. Um, and, and this is how you would do it. So you've got to ignore this, you, you know, the weather radar band right here. Um, you don't want to, to deal with that. And, and you go 80 megahertz channel where, where these are, are in Uni 1 and Uni 2, so they're max power, but then these ones are, are in the Uni 2A. And, and probably a better solution here is you put the sector at Uni 1 uh, so you can max out your power there, and then you put the horns all in Uni 2. So just there's you can see there's multiple different ways to do it, and one of the best uh, kind of ways to map it out in your mind is, is kind of put together a graph like this um, to kind of see what available spectrum is there. And of course, this is assuming there's no one else in the area at five gig with no noise, or you can get above that noise. That that complicates it even further. So you kind of end up blacking out some of these channels if they if someone is occupying them. Now, 15 minutes left, but I, I only want to chat for now. Another five minutes, different ways to frequency reuse. So this is the six sector example I showed using channel reuse three with 40 megahertz channels. Um, and then here, oh, I apologize. And this is a, a 12 sec, 12 horn uh, case using four channels with 40 megahertz channels. So now we're using all of Uni 1 and Uni 2, Uni 1 and Uni 3. Now, maximizing your performance of your your, your SM, your subscriber side, SCB side. So 
I'm here to show you the benefit of, of upgrading the CPE antenna. So instead of, instead of using this, if let's say you're, you're deciding between a small integrated CPE or 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 upgrading to a two foot dish with the connectors on it, um, and you say, well, I'm going to have them spend spend an extra fifty dollars minimum um, to do that per client, uh, but you got to keep an account. Well, what am I actually getting from doing that upgrade? One thing is you're going to be increasing your signal strength by at least, at least 6 dB. And what does that do? Is a lot of the times it'll push you up to the next modulation. So here the the, uh, the orange curves is when we're using a smaller antenna, integrated CP, and then um, these bars, sorry. So the modulation is very low, you know, times 2, times 1, QPSK. Um, but now you go up to the next modulation because you have the extra signal strength, you're buzzed the noise that much more. And, and so you get to, to pretty much increase your, your modulation rate by one. And what does that do is you get higher throughput on both down and up, and you can charge a little bit more for that. So instead of paying 50 bucks a month, you're paying 75 or 100. Um, and you're gonna get your return very quickly within the first two months, um, just by upgrading that antenna to the two foot dish. The other benefit is, is that if you had a lot of noise on that, that channel, then, then going to a two foot dish will help reduce that noise in there, in addition to the increase in gain. So it, it could be up to 6 dB or more in your center just by upgrading to the antenna and paying just a little bit more in the grand scheme of things. Now, same kind of argument can be had with your microwave link. So, you know, let's say you got a PTP 670, you're trying to max out, max out your modulation rate, channel size, and, and you're at 5.8. Using uh, for a 32 mile link, um, use the integrated antenna. That this is probably the, a poor choice to use the integrated antenna here. You can see because uh, you, you, I didn't put the modulation and locks onto, but but you can see that your your throughput is, is is significantly low. So this is the aggregate IP throughput 143. This is not one direction. This is both directions that it sums up. So it's like 70 in one direction. But that and that costs you about 2,600 dollars to use do that. Now if you upgrade and use a connectorized PTP. Uh, with a two foot dish, um, you could see here, this could be the KP two foot dish, it can be radio waves, but I just did the KP one as an example. Um, you can see that this gain increases significantly and it ends up, allows us to push to the next modulation uh, and, and now we're at 330. And, and that only costs an extra $100 because the KP dish is about 200 bucks um, and then the, the connectorized is a little bit cheaper than the integrated radio. Now, if you go to a three foot dish, it gets even better, but you're paying a little bit more. Um, so you can see that, that our, our aggregate IP went up to 409, uh, but you end up you know, paying an extra 1100 bucks. So if you, if you, you, know, if you needed that, that throughput, you know, you're starting to throttle yourself in the back hole, this is what you gotta do. You have to increase your antenna size to get above that noise. Um, the other benefit here is that the, going from a two foot, three foot, a four foot, by the, by the time you get to four foot, it, you really have to have a good reason to get to it. And I'll show you why is, is that the side lobes are drastically decreasing. So if you have some signal that's coming in, you know, interference, you know it's coming in at 60 degrees. On a two foot dish, you have about 30 dB of attenuation. On a three foot dish, you got 33. But then on the four foot bush dish, you got 36 dB. So that's going from two foot to four foot, it's an extra six dB of attenuation if it's coming, the interference is coming at this angle. But if it's coming at, let's say, this angle, it's an even bigger difference. Um, or, or if it's right next to the beam, you know, so somewhere right here, you can see that the difference could be very substantial. For here, it's a 10 dB increase going from a two foot to a, th to a four foot antenna. So going to the bigger size, it, it not only does it get you gain, it gets you more suppression in your noise floor. So you, you can have a nice, reliable link at that time. Now let's go next slide. Um, best practices, and, and I think we're gonna conclude here so we can have some question period. So we, we get this question all the time, how, how far apart should I separate my antennas? And, and, and just blanket statement, it doesn't matter what antenna size it is, I would say you're always safe with 10 feet, always safe. But you wanna bring them closer together. Um, and, and it all depends on, are you, going to be on the same frequency or are they separate frequencies? If you're on the same frequency, then you care about how much they're talking to each other. If they're on separate frequencies, all you care about is making sure you don't impact the pattern of the other one. And, and if, if that's the case, then you just want to make sure you're outside the near field zone of the antenna, um, where this is based off of the distance now, or, or the antenna size. So for bigger antenna, the near field zone um, get, gets larger, of course. 
but but and also at the same time, as you increase the the frequency, so at 5.8 is red, the the near field zone also increases. So when you end up putting an antenna in the this is called the the reactive zone. Um, it can impact the the game, the patterns, the VSWR of of that antenna. Uh, so, so you want to try to avoid being outside of it. Now, this distance d, this isn't just the total distance or length. Sorry, not distance. This, this um, uh, diameter d is not just the diameter of, the, of a circle that that encloses the antenna. It's actually if you, you take the direction you care about separating, take the shortest distance of it. So here, if I was separating horizontally, I'd look at the the d of the width of the antenna, and I'd make sure that uh, let's say it's it's um, one, one foot wide, I'd make sure that I'm at least out by three or four feet in the horizontal direction. But the, if, let's say this antenna here is four feet tall um, and I wanted to stack vertically, then I want to be at least here between anywhere between five up to 10 feet, uh, 12 feet vertically separated in order to minimize impact to the patterns. So it's always take the dimension of the antenna in the direction you want to separate as the as uh, wh how much separation you should give, and then reference one of these charts here, calculate the near field zone. Um, now, if you're on the same channel, one thing more important you gotta f figure out is, is how much isolation I wanna get so we're not cross-talking between the two. So you look at one thing as the free space path loss and also the pattern in that direction. So if they're back to back, you can see that the front to back's, th let's say 30 dB. So each antenna will give you at least 30 dB of attenuation or isolation. And that's just if they're touching each other um, in an ideal sense. So that's 60 dB of isolation, plus the path loss, let's say now you add five feet of, of ice, um, separation between the two. So now you're adding an extra 50 dB of isolation. That's 110 dB of isolation, um, theoretically between uh, uh, two sectors that are back to back that are uh, five feet separated. So then you go and look at how much power you're transmitting and then you receive uh, expected receive signal strength on the AP and then that's how you kind of make sure that you're not going to be washing out your receive signals, receive signals to the AP is, is by looking at how much transmitted power and isolation you have between the two antennas. But all this is, I, I, you know, I can't give you rough guidelines uh, on any antenna because every antenna is different, every frequency different, every application different, every radio is different. So it, it really is application specific. It's something you got to pick up on. Uh, and hopefully, you know, you know, after you do 10 of these installs in very similar climates and environments, you can figure it out. Uh, best practice for, for alignment very, very shortly here is, is main thing is use your RF link planning tools, RF propagation tools, something like Cloud RF. I've been using this software extensively. It's great. Link Planner is awesome too for Cambium. Tower coverage is a good al alternative too, or or get even fancier um, and pay a little bit more. But these are very low cost options. Link Planner is free, free by the way. Um, and but these will spit out to you your where to toy, point the antenna from from true north and magnetic north. Some of them it's hard to see here. Will tell you how much down tilt it is. Um, from the AP to the antenna. So this will tell you that you have to tilt up your antenna on the CP side by 4.8 degrees. Uh, and then you, once you have that information, use GPS, waypoints, even a gun scope uh, in order to kind of line everything up. Avoid using compasses because towers end up having a lot of iron in them and compasses will, will deviate and, and, and give you a little bit wrong reading. So, so waypoints is, is and the GPS and a gun scope is kind of a very good method to do it. Um, when you're trying to do the elevation tilt, use a digital level placed against a flat surface. So on the KP dishes, put it against the N-type connector, on the housing on the top, on the sectors, always put it against the back surface, never the top caps, because the top caps can sometimes be a little bit off the angles. Uh, so digital level against the back surface. Now, when you're trying to align a point-to-point -point link, be very careful, making sure you use your GPS, um, that you're in the right location and that and uh, that you don't lock onto the side lobes. Uh, so if you do your RF propagation study, it says you're supposed to be at 77 dBm, but you, you're actually picking up at 80, 82 or something, 85. Um, you probably locked onto a side lobe instead. And so if you see that deviation, try to tilt the beam to improve the signal strength. You, it, it really is a manual procedure, as a lot of you guys know, it's just monitoring, uh, receive and transmit signal strength. Um, on both sides to make sure it's optimized. So I'm sure a lot of you guys have it in the you know very down pat. Just some of the tips that I've picked up over the few few years here. 
um, from our clients. And then there's a lot of alignment tools on the market, Sunsight, 3Z Telecom, uh, SBAA005. Boom. Uh, radio compatibility, I, I'm going to skip this, but really any 3 gig radio, uh, you can use it with the 3 gig sectors. You want to match up ports to ports in, in any sense. So I'm just going to slowly go through here. And uh, I think I'm going to open it up to questions at this point. So Infinite is more than just KP and Radio Waves. It, it's we're a bunch of brands. Uh, Kalis should be removed here. We just sold it, but um, we, we, you know, we can provide a lot of the uh, electrical uh, component needs. So thank you very much for for listening. Thank you. Um, so people are excited about uh, the announcement on the horns. Can you uh, just repeat when those will be available? Oh, there was that question. Yeah, so so we have a, a launch tentative launch date of June. Um, I I see just due to the, the way the virus is kind of uh, delaying things, we're going to be pushing into the J July. So for your your summer deployments, we're we're trying really hard to get these ready for you guys. Uh, talk talk to to you know Streakwave, Mike uh, Hopridge is an excellent sales guy with KP uh, to get a more definitive date, and and uh, we'll follow up with you um, when it's. We're getting closer to that day. Very exciting. Um, the next question that came in uh, earlier in your presentation, they are asking, could you connect two two by two radios to the four by four omnis? Yep, you can. Just make sure they're on different channels, because um, if they're on the same channel, you'll have isolation issues between the two. All right, perfect. And we'll leave it for one more question um, as time is running out. Um, what software did you use for the propaganda propagation study? Yeah, so I, I actually I switch between a lot of them. Um, I've been something like this. This is uh, using Cloud RF. They got a, a, a very cool web interface to do it. It's all online. It's it's very cheap. It's like 10, 15 bucks. Um, but 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 I, I'm liking this one right now. It allows you to export the maps into Google Google Maps. Um, a lot of very neat functionality. You can automate it all with an API. Uh, and like I said, it's very affordable to do it. Um, I've used tower coverage too. I've, I've used that for a few years and I've liked that. And um, yeah, so just those two softwares for now. And the, also Link Planner is, is great with the Cambium equipment because it has everything all loaded in there and the default settings are, are, are really good for getting you started. Awesome. Um, well, thank you, Justin, for doing the presentation and everyone that attended. Is there anything else that you wanted to just add before we um, let everyone go, Justin? Uh, no, um, I mean, we're, we're going to be at, uh, uh, I guess one thing, we'll be at Wisp America, come and see us in a few weeks, and that's it. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye.